Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing anticoagulants and thrombolytics. Okay, so we have a few more anticoagulants to discuss, a few more rare ones that are less often used but are still worth knowing about, and then we'll talk about the thrombolytics. Okay, so the anticoagulants that I want to discuss now all inhibit specific coagulation factors once they're in the active state, so they're going to inhibit active forms of certain coagulation factors, and most of the drugs that I'm going to talk about now are going to be inhibitors of thrombin, factor 2A, of course the enzyme which actually converts fibrinogen into fibrin monomers and therefore is crucial in the conversion of fibrinogen into a fibrin mesh. And of course if you keep inhibiting those enzymes uh, then you're not going to get the building of a fibrin mesh and therefore you're not going to get the building of a thrombus. Okay, so uh, the next class of drugs then that I'd like to talk about are what are known as the Pyridins. Okay, now these are drugs that are derived from an anticoagulant that is found in the saliva of the medicinal leech. So the medicinal leech, it feeds on blood. Okay, now it does not want the blood that it is feeding on to coagulate. So it contains an anticoagulant, and this anticoagulant, uh, it works by inhibiting factor 2A thrombin, and hence preventing the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin monomers, and hence preventing the production of a fibrin mesh, and therefore uh, a clot. Okay, so the hirudins are drugs that are derived from this um, molecule that is in the saliva of the medicinal leech. Okay, so examples then are leperidin and bivalarudin. So leperudin is a notable example, and another notable example is bivalarudin. Okay, so these are two examples of hiridins which work by inhibiting factor 2A. So they inhibit thrombin, and that's how uh, they have their anticoagulant effect. Okay, now both of these drugs have to be given by intravenous injection. Okay, so both of these are administered intravenously. Okay, so that's the hiridins. Now what I want to talk about are other drugs that work by just inhibiting an active coagulation factor. One more that's going to work by inhibiting thrombin, and another that's going to work by inhibiting activated factor 10, and therefore also is going to close off both the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascade and prevent the production of a fibrin mesh. These two are not going to be hiridins, however, and they're going to be uh, givable by oral means, and I don't know why I've Put the, I apologise for that, I've turned that into a Roman numeral, I've turned it into the Roman numeral 4, it's meant to just be intravenous here. Ignore what I just did there, uh, wasn't thinking, wasn't concentrating. Okay, so, uh, these next two drugs then, let's go on to the next two drugs. So the next two drugs that also work by inhibiting coagulation factors are dabigatran and rivaroxaban. Now, dabigatran also inhibits thrombin, like the hiridins, rivaroxaban, let me just make sure I spell it correctly, like so, rivaroxaban works by inhibiting factor 10A, okay, the one upstream of thrombin, so I'll just get my picture of the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascade back in a moment. Okay, so I'll get that in now. So remember, factor 10A is the one which combines into a complex with factor 5A and calcium on the surface of activated platelets to form uh, the prothrombinase, and this has to occur in both the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways. Okay, and this complex, this prothrombinase complex, is what converts prothrombin factor 2 that binds to the surface of activated platelets again by calcium uh, into thrombin factor 2A. Uh, which is then going to start converting fibrinogen into fibrin monomers and forming the fibrin mesh. Okay, so dabigatran and rivaroxaban then, these can both be given orally and they are inhibitors of these very important coagulation factors and hence they are going to prevent the production of a fibrin mesh and hence they're going to um, be anticoagulants, very powerful anticoagulants and stopping uh, thrombosis from occurring. Okay, so those are the last of the anticoagulants that I want to mention. As I say, it's rarer that you will see people prescribe these, but occasionally they are used, uh, so they're well worth being aware of. 
Now what I want to talk about is the thrombolytics, the drugs that are actually used to trigger the lysis of a thrombus that has formed. So all of the anticoagulants that we've so far talked about, these were all preventative measures to try and prevent thrombosis from ever occurring. Now we're going from the other aspect. We're saying a thrombus has occurred, maybe the person has had a heart attack or a stroke because they have a thrombus in one of their coronary blood vessels or a cerebral blood vessel. Uh, and now what we want to do is we want to lyse that blood clot to try and um, produce blood flow to the affected area once again, return blood flow to that area. Okay, so we're now going to talk about the thrombolytics. Okay, so the first one that I want to mention is streptokinase. Okay, and I should just say right away, the way we're going to do this, all of the thrombolytics that I'm going to show you, and I'm only going to talk about two thrombolytics, they're always going to work by activating the body's own means for uh, breaking down uh, blood clots. And remember from the video on hemostasis, uh, right at the end we discussed fibrinolysis. In order to lyse a blood clot, you need to break down the fibrin meshwork. And in order to break down fibrin, you need this enzyme called plasmin. Now, plasmin has an inactive precursor that is circulating within the blood called plasminogen. Uh, so what we need to do is activate plasminogen to plasmin so that the plasmin will then start breaking down the fibrin uh, of the blood clot. And that's how we're going to lyse the thrombus. Okay, so thrombolytics are all going to work by promoting the activation of uh, plasminogen to plasmin. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about streptokinase. So streptokinase is an enzyme that uh, certain streptococcus bacteria produce, and it has the property that it will activate plasminogen to plasmin. Okay, so we harvest streptokinase from streptococci, and if someone has just had a heart attack or a stroke, we give them an intravenous injection of streptokinase, and it will then go into the blood and convert plasminogen into plasmin, and the plasmin will then lyse the fibrin. It will break down the fibrin of the thrombus, and once the fibrin mesh has been degraded, then the platelets will just fall apart, and the thrombus will be lysed. So this is the way streptokinase works. Now there is a very important thing to know about streptokinase. Uh, streptokinase is antigenic. It will provoke an immune response. It will provoke antibodies to be produced against it. So within four days of having uh, intravenous streptokinase injected into you, you will have antibodies against streptokinase and therefore all of the streptokinase will be removed from the bloodstream or at least it will be complexed with antibody molecules and therefore will be cleared from the bloodstream. So streptokinase stops working and of course this means that you can never use it again. So streptokinase is a drug that you can have once and once only. Once you've had it once, you will have activated the adaptive immune response against it and you will have antibodies against it now. Okay, and if we were to use it again, the adaptive immune response would fire up much more quickly and you'd get antibodies appearing very quickly and they just uh, inactivate it and it would probably be quite dangerous to use it again. Okay, so streptokinase can be used once and only once, and it's given to people who have just had heart attacks or strokes to lyse the thrombi uh, in their coronary or cerebral circulations, respectively, to try and open up the blood vessel again. Okay, so it's usually given very quickly after having a heart attack or a stroke. Okay, the other major thrombolytic are, uh, the other, well, the other major class of thrombolytics are the recombinant tissue plasminogen activators. Okay, so uh, what are shortly abbreviated as RTPAs. Okay, so the little r here is for recombinant, and then the TPAs is for tissue plasminogen activators. So remember, in the video on hemostasis, we talk about tissue plasminogen activator, uh, which we abbreviate as TPA. Tissue plasminogen activator is released by endothelial cells, and it is an endogenous activator of plasminogen. It activates plasminogen in the blood to form plasmin, and this is the way the body uh, endogenously activates fibrinolysis, the breakdown of blood clots. And what we're going to do is we're going to use recombinant DNA technology, and we're going to 
put the gene for tissue plasminogen activator into some other organism, uh, most likely a bacterium. I don't know the actual technicalities of this, but most likely bacterium. And we're going to get those bacteria to produce uh, this molecule, tissue plasminogen activator, this enzyme for us. Uh, so recombinant tissue plasminogen activators, all we mean is this molecule grown in bacterium, basically. And, and one of the, uh, one name for a recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, one example of a recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, a notable example, is called autoplase. Okay, so this is, to stress again, just like recombinant insulin, where we have taken the human insulin gene, put it into bacteria, and we get them to make human insulin, which is then injected into uh, people who are insulin dependent and diabetic. Uh, here, what we've done is we've taken the gene for tissue plasminogen activator, and we've put it into some other organism, and we get the other organism to produce it, and this is now called recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, and an example of one of these uh, is called autoplase. So again, in people who have just suffered heart attacks or strokes due to a thrombus, and I should stress, you would never give these drugs to people who have suffered from hemorrhagic stroke. It would have to be ischemic stroke. So remember, there are two major types of stroke. Okay, strokes can be divided into ischemic strokes, and these are the sort that we're actually interested in here. Ischemic strokes are those that are caused by a blockage of a blood vessel, usually because of a thrombus or because of a thromboembolus. Uh, and then the other more dramatic type, a rarer type, is hemorrhagic stroke, and this is where basically a blood vessel bursts open inside of the brain and you bleed everywhere. Of course there you would not want to give uh, a thrombolytic because it would block the hemostasis process which would be helping there. Okay, you would make it much much worse if you gave uh, these drugs to someone who had suffered a hemorrhagic stroke. So if someone had suffered a stroke, the first thing you would want to ascertain is are they suffering from an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke? And you would never give these drugs streptokinase or autoplase until you had ascertained that they were definitely suffering from an ischemic stroke. So if they're suffering from an ischemic stroke or a heart attack, and the thrombus is still intact and needs nising, then these drugs can be given, either streptokinase or autoplase. And the nice thing about autoplase is that because it's the human version, of course it doesn't produce antibodies, it's not antigenic, it doesn't promote uh, the production of antibodies uh, by the adaptive immune system, and therefore it can be used more than once. Okay, uh, so those are the two examples of thrombolytics that I want to discuss. And with that, we will end this video on anticoagulants and thrombolytics.